Hi, I'm Brett, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of how painting works in Chrome. So um, most of you know that we mostly use Skia for painting, which is a uh, sort of a raster graphics library. It was originally developed for mobile devices, and it's what Android uses to do all of its painting. So we use Skia uh, for our Windows and our Linux port to paint the web pages. And you'll see um, it's a bit confusing because our Windows port is actually uh, the WebKit Skia graphics port plus a bunch of Windows stuff that we've layered on. And so that includes stuff like Windows fonts, um, which obviously will be different from different platforms, even though they might all use Skia for, for drawing things like rectangles and images. So our Linux port uses Skia plus the Chromium Linux uh, files. And Mac is a little bit different because it mostly matches how Safari draws things. We've kept most of their code, changed it in a few places, but it's, it's a bit different. And so uh, graphics context is the main thing in WebKit that represents uh, how stuff is drawn. It has most of the APIs for drawing rectangles, graph, you know, graphics, clipping, all this stuff. And as with most of the objects I'll discuss today, it's split into two parts. The first part is the cross-platform code, which is in graphicscontext.cpp. It contains stuff that sets up various transforms and sort of generic things that don't depend on the underlying graphics layer. And then there's also a platform specific part. There's, there's some set of functions in graphics context that are designed to be implemented uh, for each platform. And so it's not a separate object. It's, it, it doesn't use inheritance or anything. It's just you link in a different file and now you've got Windows graphics context. You link in a different file and you've got the Mac graphics context. And WebKit doesn't make any assumptions about how the graphics context works internally. So for most of our painting, it, we draw to a bitmap. We could be drawing to some kind of vector printer. It doesn't really care. It's just calling functions on this graphics context. There's a couple things that are split. What's that? <laughs> There's a couple things that are split off from graphics context because they're very complicated. And the first one is fonts. So fonts has the same uh, attribute as graphics context in that there's a cross-platform file and then that there are different platform-specific files to integrate with each platform's font rendering. And there's primarily two code paths which you'll see in terms of font rendering. The first is for what's called simple text, and that includes things like English and not any Latin language, but it also includes some really complicated things that you would think would be complicated, like Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean. But those are all considered simple because each character does not depend on any context around it. It can be rendered independently. So you draw a letter A, and it doesn't matter if it's followed by a B. It looks like a letter A. And same is true with Chinese, um, but it's not true for some other languages. So for simple text, WebKit ha has some clever optimizations to go faster. And the first is that it maintains a map of uh, sort of font and character pairs to font and glyph pairs. So what this allows is, say we say we have an Arial letter A, and it maps to Arial uh, glyph index 22. And a glyph index is an index into some font specific table that includes the picture of the letter you want. So a glyph is really a picture. And there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping from characters to glyphs. For example, a font could have different versions of A. Maybe it has a small caps, capital A. And that's the same character as regular capital A, but it would have a different glyph, and there might be different cases when it would be used. This is also how font fallback works. So if I have, uh, for example, Arial smiley face, and Arial doesn't happen to have smiley face, it would actually map to a different font. So in this case, it would say Arial smiley face maps to Zaf Dingbat's glyph index 30. Um, once we have a glyph, uh, WebKit maintains a separate cache of the widths of each of these glyphs. So that's stored in the glyph width map, and it allows WebKit to very quickly look up the width of a glyph in a certain font size. Because generally measuring text in the operating system is super slow. If you ask for the width of a word, it's going to come back in quite a noticeable amount of time. So fast pathing any kind of text measurement you can is really important. So that's the simple path. And WebKit can just quickly add up the widths of the characters and do text layout really, really quickly. For the complex path, it's, it's a lot different. It can't make any assumptions about what the text looks like uh, inside of, of certain known 
breakpoints like spaces and punctuation. So for example, if you have an Arabic word, uh, you know, Arabic, some letter followed by another Arabic letter would look very different if, uh, as compared to if they were just written side by side. And this also happens for a lot of Indic fonts and even Latin fonts. You can have special Unicode combining accents where you have a, an E followed by this magic accent character. And that really means put the accent over the E. And so WebKit has some code to detect when it should use this complex path. You know, if you were using a certain language or if a certain character like one of these magic accents appears in the code. And then it falls back to the complex path, which uses the operating system specific uh, text rendering, which is Uniscribe on Windows, um, HarfBuzz on, on Linux, and ATSUI on, uh, on Apple. So this is much, much, much slower. If you, if you go to an Arabic page and you start selecting really fast, you'll notice it feels a lot slower than you know, on, a, on a regular English page. So the second thing that's uh, split out from graphics context are images. Um, because images is really how we hook into all of the platform-specific image decoders. So Chrome links in libpeng, libjpeg, and all these different things. Um, on Mac, we use the system-specific image decoders. And uh, this image ski and image Mac is how all that's hooked in. One interesting thing to note is that WebKit actually has a two-level image cache, which is kind of clever. Normally, say you draw an image, it's cached the decoded version of that image. So that's just an RGBA buffer that you copy to the screen. If you haven't used that image in a while, it will throw it away, but it will keep the encoded version of the data, which is compressed. It's sort of the original data that the server gave you. And hopefully that's a lot smaller, so we can keep a lot more cached images in memory. And if it ever needs that back, it can just run the image decoder on that data and quickly get an image back without having to wait for, uh, for the disk or for the network. OK, so we've got this graphics context. We've got this font and image system. How does that get into, uh, uh, how, how does the WebKit uh, DOM tree get into that? And I'm not an expert at this. I can point you to, uh, if you use your favorite search engine and search for WebCore Rendering Basics, you get this nice blog entry which gives a slightly more in-depth overview. But the basic way to think about it is just like there's a DOM tree which represents the logical structure of your document, there's a render tree which represents the visual structure of your document. And you know, when the web page is laid out, the render tree will be generated such that it can be painted efficiently. And then each render object, which is a node in that tree, will then know how to render itself into the graphics context. OK, so Test Shell is actually quite different than Chrome painting. So I'm going to cover that first. And Test Shell is kind of like a, a regular application, whereas Chrome is, is not regular at all. So the way a normal application works, including Test Shell, is we get an invalid rect from the operating system. The operating system, maybe part of the window was exposed and we need to paint it. Maybe we previously told the operating system we'd like to change these pixels, please. Um, which you typically do instead of just painting the pixels preemptively because that allows uh, paints to be coalesced. For example, if you're doing a lot of updating, you would issue a whole bunch of uh, invalidates to the screen, go back to the message loop. The operating system will synthesize one paint message for all of those invalidates you did. So it makes, um, you know, you don't have to worry about how often you invalidate things. You're going to get a nice one coalesced paint message containing the dirty region of the screen. So we get the invalid rec from the operating system, and we make what's called a Skia platform canvas representing that area. And the platform canvas is a wrapper around Skia's SK canvas object, which represents uh, basically a drawing surface. It's the Skia equivalent of the graphics context. And the reason we did a wrapper is that this allows us to actually talk to both Skia and the host operating system. So a platform canvas you can use the, all the regular Skia uh, drawing commands, whatever they are. And you can also get, on Windows, an HDC. And you can use the Windows GDI functions to draw text into it or any, any other thing you want. And likewise, on Mac and Linux, you can draw the, the platform native text. So we create this platform canvas for the dirty region of the screen and then stick that into a graphics context Skia. 
And that's what WebKit will then use to draw into our nice graphics context. Once we get the rendered pixels, we just copy that to the screen and we're done. OK, so how is Chrome different? The main reason that Chrome is much harder is that we require that the browser, which gets the paint messages from the operating system, and the renderer, which actually generates the bits, run totally asynchronously. They're in different processes. We don't want to block between them. So we can't just sit, get the nice dirty rect from, from the operating system and paint into it. Instead, we maintain in the browser a backing store, which is basically the most recent picture of the web page. And when the operating system requests that we paint parts of it, we just copy from this pre-rendered bitmap onto the screen. It's really fast, it's easy, we don't have to wait for anybody to give us the data. It, totally asynchronously, the renderer is generating new versions of the web page. It might be updating the whole screen, it might be updating a tiny little part, like if the cursor's blinking or you type a letter. And this stuff's coming in from IPC from the renderer, and it's just getting copied into the backing store whenever we get it. So the backing store is the way that we decouple the stuff being generated by the renderer and the request that we need to service from the operating system. And the guy that manages the backing store is the render widget, which you might have seen the related object render view. And the render widget basically handles input and paint events. And so the render widget lives in the renderer, and it talks to the corresponding object, render widget host, in the browser. And the reason that render widget and render view are separate is you can get these pop-up select boxes that you, you have little windows that pop up outside of your browser window, and they need to be rendered by WebKit, but they're not web pages. So a render widget provides the common input event and painting for basically all web pages and all little pop-ups and select boxes, and render view layers on top of that stuff necessary for navigation, uh, kind of uh, loading, all, all this type of thing. Did you have a question, Brad? Um, I was just wondering, is there any need to, uh, to lock the, the back to store while it's being updated? I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, OK, so the render widget handles all this painting and input. And uh, OK, so let's start with the renderer. How does, it, how does the renderer give the data to the browser? So the render widget gets events from two places. The first is WebKit is generating updates. So the web page layout might be changing, the cursor might be blinking, the user might be typing, and we need to update some text field. <coughs> so all this stuff happens, and WebKit's giving us invalid regions that it needs to redraw. So we coalesce those kind of as a, a faked version of what the operating system is doing um, for test shell. And we give WebKit a nice paint event and send that to the browser. And to answer Brad's question, we actually send a copy each time to the browser. So we generate a new bitmap when we want to paint, send that, we put that in shared memory so we don't have to copy it too many times. That gets sent to the browser, the browser copies it out of the shared memory and into the backing store. So the renderer never touches the backing store, it only gives us uh, bitmaps representing the updated regions which we copy. That way we don't have to do any kind of synchronization or locking between the renderer and the browser because if the renderer was drawing into the backing store as it was being read out, you would get like weird half-rendered pages on the screen. So the other way that the, uh, the renderer will uh, update is when the browser requests an update. And this might happen because the backing store is invalid. Maybe the window was resized, in which case the old backing store is the wrong size and we need a new one. Maybe uh, we just don't have a backing store for that tab because you switch tabs. And in that case, the, the browser is going to send a message to the renderer, say, hey, I need a new picture of the web page. The renderer is going to render everything and send it back up. OK. So the browser gets the, render, uh, the paint rect IPC messages from the renderer containing the new pixels. And again, just copies it into the backing store. Uh, it services operating system paint requests from that backing store. And this is kind of an important and subtle point. It sends an acknowledgment back to the renderer when it got those pixels. And this is really important because what we found when we first wrote this, the renderer would just send pixels whenever it felt like it. Whenever something changed, it would just send a new bitmap to the browser. It would copy it to the backing store, and it would be fine. 
and that worked great until the renderer was decided a lot of stuff needed to be painted. And in effect, it would start spamming the browser with thousands of paint messages. And in some cases, the browser can't even keep up. And so you get this weird, you know, out of date, everything's locked up uh, behavior. So we only allow one paint event to be in flight at once. So the renderer generates a bitmap, sends it to the browser, the browser generates an ACK, and that's when the renderer knows it can generate the next frame, basically, of the animation or whatever it's updating. And we cleverly uh, sort of overlap these. So as soon as the, the pixels are received in the browser, the browser doesn't even have to paint it to the screen. It can send an ACK back right away. And that means that the browser and the renderer can both be kind of overlapped. And the renderer can be generating the next frame while the browser is copying it to the screen. And we can actually use more than one, one CPU at a time to, to do painting. OK, so how do these backing stores work? It, they're managed by the render widget. And they're totally platform specific. We've got three totally different implementations for each of our platforms. On Linux, it's a PixMap. It lives on the X server. And ideally, we want these backing stores to be as close to the hardware as possible. So when we do get an operating system paint message, we can just copy it to the screen with you know, basically a mem copy, internal to the video card. It's really fast. Um, so for Linux, we use a, a, it's, a, it's on the X server. It doesn't require any cross-process or cross-computer talking if we need to paint it to the screen. On Mac, it's somewhat similar. It's a, a device-dependent bitmap, which is really fast to draw. But on Windows, it's not. On Windows, it's a device-independent bitmap. And the reason is that we used to use a device-dependent bitmap, and it really messed up your system. Because these uh, video card resources on Windows are very limited. And we have uh, some number of backing stores representing a full-size picture of the screen or however big your Chrome window is. And we would just kind of be using up all your GDI memory. And so random things would start failing, and weird stuff would happen, and you couldn't remote desktop into your computer. So on Windows, we're actually slower because we keep the backing stores in our own memory in the cross-platform RGBA format. And copying to the screen is a little slower because we don't know what format the video card's using. It might have 16-bit colors. It could be, have, like, 10 channel double precision floating point. It could be 8 bit. We don't know. So when we do the copy to the screen, the video card needs to do a bunch of work to, to swizzle, which kind of sucks. Um, the other thing that you get is uh, what I call the paint of doom, which probably a lot of you have seen at one point or another. And that happens when you switch a tab, and the whole system locks up, and the tab comes in really, really slowly. And then the system unlocks, and you're fine. And you're left thinking, what was that? That was really weird. Because your mouse is, doesn't even move. It's, it's like Windows is just totally hung. And the reason this happens is that the backing store gets swapped out. So we've got the backing store in our memory. We give it to Windows. Windows gives it to the video driver, says, please paint to, this, to the screen. If the backing store is swapped out, the video driver says, Windows, I need this data, please. And Windows says, I don't have it. I need to get it off this ridiculous spinning disk. And it has to go move using 1950s magnet technology and get the data off the disk onto the screen. And the video driver isn't like a, a multitask system. You know, it's the video driver. And when it's waiting for the data, nobody else is painting to the screen. The mouse isn't getting drawn. Nothing's happening. So basically, the whole system's locked up waiting for this disk swap, which is why the, the horrible behavior happens. So we've got some ideas. Ideally, we'd just ask Windows, hey, is this paged in right now? And it would say no. We would just throw it away and regenerate the bitmap, which we would much prefer to do. But it's not quite that, that simple. OK, so one thing is there's a cache of, of these backing stores. Wait, never mind. OK, so there's, there's a cache of these backing stores. We maintain up to five backing stores, uh, depending on how much memory you have. So that ideally, when you switch tabs, we don't have to go to the renderer to regenerate the image. Slide 10. Ah, I skipped this one. So uh, the, this backing store cache um, means we can switch tabs quickly without having to go to the renderer and regenerate the image. 
we maintain a separate backing store cache for uh, extensions. When extensions were first implemented, they used the same cache as everybody else, and then you get all these little tiny extensions on the screen that quickly used up your five backing store caches, and all of a sudden we were swapping all the time having to redraw the screen. So we have this kind of split cache for big images like web pages and small images like the little tiny extension buttons that might might have on your toolbar. When a, a web page goes in the background, we don't just throw away its backing store, but we don't do any work to keep it up to date. So if you resize the window or the web page decides to update itself, we'll just throw that backing store away. So this is why you don't see the paint of doom too much, because if, if you've used the tab recently or it's updated, either the backing store has been evicted from the cache or it's been touched. So you only get the paint of doom when you have a, a tab that hasn't changed, that you haven't touched in a long time, and you've done something on your system that kicks out all the memory. For example, compiling Chrome. Uh, so that's why it might happen to us more than with the random people. Is this a recent change on the resize one? Because I know it, as recent as two months ago, resizing did not cause us to invalidate backing stores from background tabs. Uh, and we would just might use right. the old size and then redraw the new size. And then I would be yeah, I think Peter's right. that We don't actually preemptively delete them when you switch. Um, but we don't uh, try to re-render, I guess. I can repeat Hello? the question. Hello? <laughs> okay. Um, now what was I asking? So when, um, are the backing stores for tabs that aren't currently visible like marked as purgeable to the VM system so they get, so instead of being paged out and paged back in, they'll just get thrown away? Uh, on Windows, we... You cannot do that on Windows, yeah. to my knowledge. Okay, but do we do it on Mac or Linux? Well, on Mac and Linux, it's a device-dependent bit. Oh, right, so they're totally in the different. graphic card memory already. Yeah. Huh? So I, it might be nice if we could tell it that. I'm not sure that we can, we can easily tell it, hey, this bitmap you have on the video card, you can throw away if you feel like it. Okay. I mean, if you know how to do it, you know, write a patch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that level of stuff. Okay, so uh, what happens is if, if we don't have a backing store, we don't have anything to paint and we don't want to wait for the renderer in the browser to generate a backing store. So we have to paint white and that kind of sucks. We call these white out and we actually have a histogram for that. You can go see uh, how long you're waiting staring at a white screen for the page to come in when you switch tabs and obviously we want to drive that down. The other thing that happens is if you're rapidly resizing the window, we can't get resized uh, web page images from the render synchronously. So Windows, to keep everything really smooth, it would really like us to paint synchronously as the window's being resized, so the content of the window exactly tracks your cursor. And so what you get is kind of some tearing where there'll be a, like a white section. If you resize the window really quick, you can see sort of a white border as it's kind of keeping up with your resizing. So what we try to do is optimize this in some cases, where the render widget host in the browser will block up to 50 milliseconds for the renderer to generate a new image. So if you're resizing and the page can be rendered and we can context switch fast enough in less than 50 milliseconds, we can actually render a resize or a uh, tab expose event synchronously, which makes everything feel much snappier and it eliminates this whiteout problem for very simple pages, assuming the renderer is paged in and everything is happy. Um, of course, if you're on a very complicated page or the renderer is paged out, you're still going to see the white tearing on the side or the blank tab uh, for some amount of time. And that's just due to our, our architecture where we never want to block the, the user waiting for some web page. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yeah, I had another one actually. Back up to uh, fonts with the two rendering paths. Uh -huh. the, some Roman language fonts do have ligatures or contextual forms that would require um, like using the complicated path. So yeah. do we detect that? Uh, no. So we don't get ligatures or contextual forms. 
So the, okay, so those those will only show up if it's known that it's like an Arabic font or right. something like that. So we could we could decide, oh, this has an fi and the font has a cool fi ligature, and um, we'll use Uniscribe for that, or maybe we can special case some known combinations. But WebKit doesn't do anything like that. Yeah. So now that the font designers are all getting into the possibility of downloadable fonts, I think they they may start clamoring for that because they've all been doing open type fonts with. Thousands yeah. of glyphs and special ligatures and things like that. So the uh, Firefox does something interesting where they have a there's a CSS property you can give it the rend rendering quality mm -hmm. or yeah. something like that. And what that will do is if you set that to like ultra high, it will actually run everything through the complex text path, and you'll get the nifty ligatures and all that. So yeah, that's a good idea. Because I think I think if we want to implement it, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, the native APIs tend to do that too, saying like, do you want to use ligatures or not? <coughs> yeah. Uh, Dirk. So. Um, <coughs> the the browser render architecture in Chrome that you described for painting is basically the X Windows architecture. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, it seems like we did a few things that X Windows doesn't do, and in particular, we re-implemented it to some extent on Linux instead of just using X directly. So, could you talk about like it, would it be possible for us to actually just re-implement Linux directly on top of X and skip this parts in the renderer? And are there reasons why we don't do things like double buffering in order to eliminate some of the races you talked about? Um, so on, on Linux, we actually have a special optimization where when we paint the web page, we allocate that bitmap, which is stored in shared memory, using whatever magic type of shared memory X uses. And so there's, it eliminates an extra copy. So the render draws directly into this memory. The browser never <laughs> touches it. And it just hands that off to the X server, says paint into the backing store that you already own. So uh, Linux is actually a little more efficient in that respect than our Windows implementation. And hopefully, we're not doing too much extra stuff on top of X Windows. But you could have the renderer just write sending commands directly to the X server. Uh, that we could have the renderer sending commands directly to the X server. We don't for several reasons. One is for security. and. The other is that that's kind of what we're doing now, because we're painting. We do all software painting into a bitmap, rather than having uh, X commands that draw text and draw rectangles and things like that. And we need that primarily because we need to draw lots more complicated things than X was designed to do. And so since we need to, to send a bitmap to the server, that's basically what we do. We send the bitmap drawing command to the server via the browser, and there's not a lot of extra stuff that gets in the way there. Else? Yeah. Could you briefly contrast what we do uh, to what Safari does on the various platforms? So Safari works, uh, which is just like Firefox and IE to my knowledge, basically like Test Shell. Um, there's no extra backing store. Um, the operating system on Mac, at least, implements a nice backing store for you, so you don't get these uh, flickering. But there's no uh, complicated extra backing store and all this asynchronous stuff. So it's pretty straightforward. No other questions? Peter? So I was wondering if there was one caveat on the high performance resizing thing where um, because we're blocking, um, uh, the, the <coughs> resizing looks better in terms of not frequently having white at the edges, mm -hmm. but perhaps worse in terms of the window size itself not tracking your mouse as fast. Is that correct that we're making that trade off? Um, or does maybe because <laughs> what's happening if we don't make that trade off is we're getting a a resize. We're painting the old image and we're painting white, and then we're sending the request to the renderer to for a new bitmap, and then we're painting that. So it's actually might be less work total to wait. You know what I mean? Because because we're doing extra painting if we're not doing the synchronous thing. I'm just thinking that Windows maybe can draw the uh, the window frame itself um, sooner in one case. But now yeah, that I think about it, Windows probably draws the frame before it even hands you control. So yeah, and 50 milliseconds isn't enough that you really notice. At least that's what we found. You can try it at home. 
Have you tried keeping the device independent bitmap on Windows in a format that by uh, chance matches the native device type so that it has the same uh, 5565 bit thing? Well, we, we don't, we can't, we might be able to do that. Um, it's extra work. And then we have to, I don't think in general we can always do it. Uh, like if we can detect it's 8 bit, maybe we can do it. I don't know about that. There's also uh, byte ordering issues, and I'm not sure we know what the video card's doing. Maybe you you can tell me how to do it. But. <laughs> Brett, I have a question remote. Okay. Um, related to that one, if if we used to work with with device dependent bitmaps, that must have meant that we could render into those formats. So it seems like the previous question is quite applicable. Uh, at least in the cases where we could have used device dependent anyways, we could have this still not tie up the resource by just query the device format. If we support it, we use that one rather than ignoring the possibility of matching the format. We, when we did it before, we never actually did the conversion ourselves. We drew, used a Windows API to, to copy from our bitmap to its device independent magic thing. So we never saw the other. Oh, OK. I, I don't Got know it. the details Thank of how you. Windows implements that, so maybe we can do something clever, but I don't know. Okay. Thank you.